and we are live welcome to mining for wakey podcast i have an exciting panel today um, valeria aldernon kevin and mills everybody uh, we are discussing uh, the cognitive exaptation and exaptation in general uh, used in uh, in several like mentioned by john in uh, a lot of his uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series. Um, okay, uh, Algernon, uh, would you like to uh, tell us what general exaptation is? Okay. Um, the term exaptation is concept in evolutionary biology, I guess originally. It refers to a trait that has been co-opted for use uh, other than the one which it was originally done in natural selection. The process describes how a feature how a feature acquires a function that was not acquired through natural selection. For example, feathers might have evolved for temperature regulation but were later co-opted for flight. In this case, the feathers would be an a the feathers would be an acceptation because they were not originally designed for flight, quote unquote design there. Um, and so that's sort of a let's say like the physical space of an example of acceptation. Pass to the next person. Mm, thank you. Um, Kevin, would you like to add a little bit? Yeah, so, so this might be helpful to mention that I think the term was coined by uh, Stephen Gould and Elizabeth uh, Virba, B-R-B-A, in their 1982 paper titled Exaptation, a Missing Term in the Science of Form. And it's a pretty technical paper, but um, to add on to the feather example, so this gets kind of confusing, but I'll try to do my best here. Um, so the feathers for thermal regulation or body heat, right? It's thought that maybe they were actually adapted first to, or sorry, they were zapped into catching insects. And so like, there's this kind of feedback loop between like having an apt adaptation that can lead to an exaptation, and that new exaptation can lead to another adaptation. So this is going to be weird, but so just follow me for a second. So there's development. So we got the right the feathers for like body heat stuff. And then they might actually help increase the surface area, right, for catching insects for um, ancient uh, biological entities. I think there's a uh, and then there's development of large contour feathers, right, and their arrangement on the arm that were adaptations, right, for insect catching, but then they can become exapted for flight. And then if we go to like the I think the black heron in South Africa. They do this thing where they kind of like use their wings to like create a like a shade over the water so they can see the fish to like hunt for them and so then you might think okay so we have these uh this what's called a mantling behavior that's what the whole like kind of umbrella you know creating a shadow on the water is called um and that you know that can you know so that exaptation can then lead to an adaptation where they're like developing and selecting for motor functions to like encourage that behavior so the wings, the mantling behavior essentially becomes a uh, an exaptation for hunting fish. So like the feather has a very interesting kind of trajectory of like, you know, first it's just like the adaptation is what it was originally fitted for. And that can lead to selection for a new adaptation for like a different function. And then you can kind of keep doing this process recursively. Okay, with that being said, I think Mills is next. Thank you. Oh, hey, Jalad. Hey, Jalad. Uh, so uh, to introduce Jalat, we are doing uh, a short introduction into ad, um, exaptation. And so, so far, uh, Kevin uh, gave an example of exaptation. Um, Mills, a next example of exaptation. You can think of one, of one and let us know as well. Mills, what's your example? And I will share your screen, of course. So one of my favorite examples of exaptation uh, growing up in Miami, it was kind of a big story at the time. Um, some migrants from Cuba actually modified a truck and uh, welded pontoons on the side, uh, made it watertight, and dropped the drive shaft down to a propeller and used this as like an amphibious vehicle to make the trip from Cuba to uh, Florida. And I always thought that was really cool. Unfortunately, they didn't, you know, keep it. They pretty much shot it a bunch of times and sunk it but that's one of my favorite examples growing up yeah 
that's awesome uh, I, I really love that one thank you so much mm, okay Jula, do you have one example of acceptation on a go? <laughs> Would you like to wait? Um, there's the the obvious ones that, for instance, Verveki talks about, or I think the three that I have are the one like the tongue that was developed for detecting poison and is then used to talk. There's the feathers that were used for thermal uh, isolation, uh, insulation, and then used to fly. And then there's uh, that video of uh, Zizek that I think was on your server uploaded, right? Like we were talking about it in the cultural sense, but some some cultural trends were created for one purpose, but then were exacted into another. So uh, that was an interesting one. I didn't uh, consider it before. But uh, it's interesting to consider if acceptation in in the realm of ideas or culture. Thank you, thank you, Jalat. Valeria. Yeah, uh, the, the I remember the the example of the tongue is interesting because the the tongue. I remember Rebecca talking about it being a muscle that is very flexible and it's in where the air is passing and it can move around so it's it evolved to move food around in your mouth and then it got repurposed for uh, uh for speaking because it was right there at the right place um and uh, uh i think the most interesting thing that Vivek, in in the, the context of Vivek's, uh work is when we we talk about like Schlieff uh, uh, was talking about of cognitive acceptation, something where the brain is doing something and then it gets that that thing that the brain is doing, that skill is repurposed for doing something else. So uh, John talks about a lot this book called Metaphors We Live By. I forgot the authors, Lankoff and something. Uh, we are used to doing things with our body, for example, going on a journey and then we can use this uh, uh, everything that we do about journeys to think about our life when we think that life is a journey. You can take the wrong path. You can uh, uh, you can say that it's about the going and not the, the the place where the destination. And that there's all this this metaphors that you can think about your life in terms of uh, of a journey, of a way. Another example that uh, uh, John uses is that he claims that during the Paleolithic, I think, the uh, humankind got through a process of evolution that was not biological evolution, but was an evolution in cognition, where people started to, they developed some kind of psychotechnologies, for example, uh, uh, numeracy for very practical purposes. Like they wanted numbers to count their cattle, to count their, I don't know, things that they needed to survive. But in the abilities that they needed to count, they used those abilities to turn it into abstract thinking. So yeah, that's the book. Um, so that's an example of uh, cognitive acceptation. One example that I don't remember John talking about it, so I might have kind of come up with it myself and therefore it might be wrong, but is, um, the way we anthropomorphize everything, this tendency that we have to anthropomorphize everything, might be our brain accepting our mechanisms for social cognition into all kinds of things. So, for example, I don't know, think about the guiding principles of the universe as a person that's God, or maybe that's a bad example because it's controversial, but uh, uh, think about my computer being annoying me. That is, uh, uh, it's because we are so used to, we have so much in our brain that is dedicated to dealing with other people that we end up dealing with the computer as if the computer was a person. So that's the things that I have to to pitch in. The last one, yeah, thank you. a little bit of a grain of salt because uh, I don't know where I got that from. Might have been from my own head. So. No, I actually uh, did not think about uh, us anthropomorphizing 
uh, the, the home, let's say, usual appliances. I don't know if computer can be considered an appliance. <laughs> But like our usual kind of technology that we work with every day, uh, if it's it's a if it's a way, yeah, it's an interesting thing to consider. Thank you. Okay, uh, I actually have a clip uh, that uh, talks about uh, an example of acceptation that Gilad mentioned with the tan, uh, which uh, which we developed. Um, we adapt and adapt and we repurposed. Let's say, let's use another word. We repurposed for uh, communicating with others, and um, it's it's uh, from the introductory episode into awakening from the meaning crisis. Uh, so episode one called the introduction, um, and just to put a little bit uh, into the context, he talks about rituals. So. Uh, when we are like prehistorical humans uh, want to interact with each other and uh, we developed tra trading uh, and also initiation rituals and then the, there is a he talks about the third ritual uh, let me present and then we can discuss it okay, sure. there you go I hope there will be no subtitles this time. Uh, by the way, guys, can you see it, right? Yes. Thank you. Ah. Now, there's a third kind of ritual that starts to emerge. And it seems to have picked up on these cognitive enhancements that the trade rituals and the initiation rituals bring. So I need to introduce an idea to you that's going to become pervasive. This is the notion of exaptation. Exaptation. Now, originally, this is an idea from biology, but the work of Michael Anderson has brought it directly into uh, understanding how the brain operates, how cognition operates. Acceptation in, in biological terms is an evolutionary mechanism. Uh, so, for example, I'm using my tongue now to speak. Okay? Tongues did not evolve for speech. If they did, all the animals that had tongues would be speaking at you, and that'd be terrifying. <laughs> Especially your cat. If your cat talks to you, I'm sure that, well, that would be terrifying. So... What did tongues evolve for? They evolved to move food around in your mouth. So they're very flexible. And they're poison detectors. So they have all, this is your last dis, dis, defense, right, for poison. Yeah. Right? So they have all of these nerve endings. So you have this highly sensitive, highly flexible muscle. Now, just because of the way we evolved, this muscle is also in the air passageway because Evolution is not an intelligent designer. You use the same tube for breathing and for food. Very bad design. But nevertheless, that's how it is. So your tongue can interrupt your airflow. Flexible, sensitive muscle that can interrupt airflow. That's what I need for speech. So the tongue was exapted. Evolution didn't have to make a speaking machine from scratch. It took something that evolved for one purpose and was able to exapt it and use it for another. So... What Michael and Anderson and others are arguing Okay. So mm, uh, I, I think at that point I would like to invite the free discussion, let's say. So, popcorn style. But I will call out Valeria first. <laughs> I did the thing that I'm thinking is just that it's uh, uh, how, I don't know, interesting that Schlieff and I picked up on half of the example and between the, the two of us that, that uh, uh, the, uh, something neat about it. I don't think that I have anything of value to say right now. So. I guess like, I'd like to jump in for a second and comment that so I think we made this distinction earlier, but just like put a fine point on it. There's a difference between like the biological acceptation and the cognitive acceptation. And 
as far as I can tell, like Vicky's, you know, in his previous or other lectures, like makes a very strong analogy between like the process of evolution and fitness to like the process of cognition, right? And like kind of cognitive fitness to the world. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great one. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. The thing I'm, I'm trying to pinpoint is the, the limits of what we call acceptation, what we don't, because um, a, a lot of us mentioned uh, metaphor as uh, some sort of acceptation, and I'm just not sure that it is acceptation. Maybe it isn't. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just like I'm wondering whether metaphor... Um, like uh, the journey example, like whether, or the, the appliances example, like whether um, treating something with the, the metaphor of it in mind, like as something else, is that really acceptation? Because I'm just, I'm always concerned because there's a tendency to sort of stretch these terms a bit out of their domain until they can mean absolutely anything. So that's what I, I'm kind of trying to pinpoint. I would say for me, um, when I think of acceptation in this space, uh, like in the mental space, I think of skills or habits or I'll say ways of thinking. There aren't like, you know, it's not like once you learn some skill that you're always doing that but say if you regularly meditate and try to quiet your mind and whatever different styles and exercises maybe they do one where you try to expand your awareness so you try to become aware of every sound in the environment and sort of shift your focus from one thing to another and recognize that you kind of can steer your attention and your awareness so if you're doing exercises like that this, the doing of the meditation, you would say, oh, I'm just doing the meditation, but the, you exact the skill of being able to tune your attention from doing exercise like that. And so that level of acceptation of skills is something that would come from this work. Oh no, it's Matthew's teeth. <laughs> I'm sorry, my dear, you cold. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, it's a castaneta thing, that the sound. <laughs> Streamyard. <laughs> Streamyard, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, that's totally Streamyard. Yeah, guys at Streamyard, please uh, update this issue. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I like the, yeah, I like, uh, uh, I like the comment, and uh, I am not very sure myself, that's why the disclaimer of uh, it might be wrong. I do think, though, that uh, uh, we have a lot of skills and strategies that we use for navigating paths, like physical paths, for physically navigating the world or navigating the social world. And we do reuse the skills when we talk about uh, uh, certain metaphors. So, for example, I to get frustrated with my computer as if it was an agent. It was, I don't, I'm, I probably should try to come up with an example where that's actually adaptive, but uh, because there is no point in getting upset with my computer, right? But we, we do that. So, so I guess what, what I'm wondering is like, it seems to me that when we talk about acceptation, it makes sense to talk about things that we um, we can tell what they are, we can tell what they were evolved for, and we can tell that they are actually the things that we've reused. So mm -hmm. I guess that my, my issue with the, the example of, of the uh, anthropomorphization is uh, that like I'm not sure how much of that is uh, like really engaging all of those mechanisms of, of uh, 
dealing with constant um, conscious agents, right? Like you have some sort of of spill spill over, like it's it's a thing you do, but it's not like that entire mechanism because. Yeah, I think it's a matter of degrees, right? There's some sort of spillover between everything. Yeah. Carry you Carry you. Thank you. I have a proposal here. Uh, it's uh, connected to uh, repurposing of something, uh, of a thing that was not evolved for it uh, with uh, our consciousness. Uh, and again, I already brought it up many times. I had the MP3 player, MP4 player, and uh, it had 300 songs on it. Um, and the purpose of it was, yeah, to have a device that you listen songs from. And I don't know who is that. And I have used uh, what Valeria said, uh, uh, anthropomorphization, where I decided uh, to, uh, because the screen broke of the MP4 player and I could not see which songs are there. And what I did, I shifted uh, that, that MP3 player into a mode of uh, shuffle. I, I was able like blindly to make it shuffle. So the songs would be unexpected. One of the 300 would play. I have repurposed it and the anthropomorphization element where I would talk to it as if it was uh, an oracle. I was like, okay, my MP3 for, sorry, MP4 oracle. I have a question out of 300 songs, give me an, a random example. And uh, so there is a, an element of anthropomorphization and acceptation here. If I understand the acceptation correctly, because uh, the way I understand it's repurposing. Um, we, rep we can repurpose our biological thing, or we can... Am I Isn't it like okay. moving a skill from <laughs> one domain to another? That's how I understand it. I want to hear from Kevin, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. very vehement. Uh, yeah, so it's Kevin, it's Kevin it's destroyed. It is, yeah. <laughs> it is not repurposing. It has, to, and I'm sure we're probably presuming this in our discussion, but like it has to be in the service of being fitted. Like it has to increase the fitness of the organism. Mm -hmm. That has to be a fundamental component for this, at least, you know, using um, uh, Gould and uh, Verba's like construction of it, because they have this like nice little pithy thing of adaptations gonna, that have functions. Fitted is not going to work in cognitive space very well. Well, fit it oh, yes, it does. Acceptation. Um, oh. well, hold on, let me just finish this point real quick, because they're going right. to say like that adaptation has functions and exaptations have effects, but those effects have to be in the service of the fitness of the organism. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that becomes the feedback loop, the new ground for like a new adaptation, right? Like these new kind of effects become selected for or create involved in the selection mechanism. But anyway, go ahead. That was great. So it has it has to be uh, uh, in the context of evolution, right? It's a uh, repurposing in the evolution. Does it? Because that's what, uh, uh, Kevin, that, that's what I understand. You have something that evolved for something, and then it gets repurposed in the service of evolving the organism. In, in the service of increasing their fitness, because and I, I make this kind of pedantic point because okay. gold is part of, so an older paper from like 1979 with Gould and uh, I think uh, Lewontin, like this, they, they had to call it the Spandrels of San Marcus and uh, the Panglossian Paradigm, I think is the title of it, you know, very, very academic title. But the, uh, you know, in that paper, they're actually arguing against this idea that evolution always increases fitness because they're going to say, no, 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 it has like, you have drift, you have things just going to dead ends. You have like kind of randomness improving and decreasing fitness. So they're going to like distinguish between like evolution, like, you know, because they're going to say like adaptationists, which is like a certain, you know, mm -hmm. paradigm they're arguing against, are going to say it's just a single mountain. And like, it's always in the service of getting to the peak. And that peak is like the optimal, you know, fitness for that trait to, you know, improve survival and reproduction of the organism. But they're going to say, no, no, no. Darwin himself, they would argue, is a pluralist who says there's multiple mountains. And sometimes they're like, they, there's different peaks and they'll move from one peak to the other. Or they'll just go down to the dead end and they'll just like circle around or like they'll just do weird shit. Um, so it's not always, like, they're going to say evolution is not always going to be uh, increasing the fitness of the organism. Um, anyway, but mm -hmm. but they're going to say that the adaptation, for it, as they define it, um, at least Gold and Verba, 
it has to be in the service of fitness for it to be an acceptation. And the same thing for the adaptation. Yeah, it has to be, has to be in the service of the, uh, uh, the fitness of the organism. Anyway, tag out. Thank you. Just to be just to be clear on that, like the what they're saying or what what you meant uh, in saying it is like. On the long run, there's a trend that evolution uh, needs to tend towards more fittedness because that's natural selection, right? Like that's pretty much the guiding principle. But like it's not a, a linear thing. It doesn't mean like every generation is necessarily better than the immediate previous. You'd have to maybe look over millions and millions of years to really see that trend. Is that? Is that right? Or I mean, in addition to all, all the other things you said, like there are a lot of peaks and it doesn't like not there's there isn't like the optimal uh, way of being. And like it's a whole landscape of what you can actually do from this current organism with randomness, etc. Can you rephrase the question? I'm not sure I followed. I, I was asked just what wanted to make sure that I got you correctly because you were saying that some organisms may actually go down and then spend time there. And that doesn't make sense to me on the long run because the principle of natural selection means those that are more fit actually survive and reproduce. And those over a long enough time that didn't survive and reproduce were not as fit, fitted as, as those that uh, did survive. So like, even the, I, I get the uh, the notion that there's randomness and that it's not a linear process, but it does have to have uh, an upward direction to make sense. Otherwise, what is it? Well, I mean, so, so I guess you know, let's describe like you know, so the environment radically changes. Like, and if you have like an ice age, then like what was fitted in that context is no longer fit. So that's you know, because it sounds like you're still describing this kind of single peak perspective as opposed to like multiple peaks where it's like sometimes like you know organisms will actually get wiped out because they're on the wrong peak and the landscape changes and so like that's not the best place to be anymore right it's like oh we're super adapt to like you know release heat in this really desert environment and like oh now it's an ice age and we're kind of screwed we don't retain heat um so i'm not sure like does that can you maybe is that you know, yeah no, that, that, that sorts things out for me at least uh, like the mm -hmm. the your point is like i and i definitely make sense in the, in the larger context yeah. I'm and it has the important side effect of highlighting the fact that Vivek is always talking about be it uh, evolutionary, like be it bio biological evolution or cognitive fittedness, that fit is always a property of the organism and the environment. It's talking about something being fit in itself in isolation doesn't make any sense. It's always in relation to the environment. Matthew wanted to say something. I guess I wanted to see if we could explore that just in the cognitive space, because we're doing a lot of physical evolution examples, which I think is focusing it on that. But if we're going to make claims about like, you know, acceptation requires evolution, but still in the cognitive space, that seems like we're, you know, making even a bigger claim about what acceptation is in the cognitive space than may be necessary. I mean, I see it as cognitive abilities, and we could be really concrete about that. Um, you know, cognitive skills, uh, states of mind, possibly even rebalancing your brain chemicals, a lot of things. You could still have physical sides, but you could also just say, no, you like your mental ability to recognize that you're getting upset. <laughs> you like do something to kind of meta yourself from that situation so that you can. Uh, some additional flexibility in how you react to it like that space of reaction and training that that training would be in the context of whatever exercise but the skill of being able to recognize oh wait crap what am i doing like that is the skill that is adapted to a different context and that would be i would say an example of cognitive expectation i don't know that there's any evolution or anything else required for that but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable with that. Like looking at a single life, uh, you know, and doing stuff and then using them elsewhere to call that expectation. Because like, okay, I weight lift and then 
I can be better at some sport, right? But that, like, that's not expectation. It's like I developed the the properties that are multifunctional using some, uh, you know, means to do it. Mm. But it's not like this was designed just for weightlifting and then, yeah. you know, randomly evolution, the environment changed and it, and it made me See, more fit, like, you know, used to, to something else. So, I mean, I agree I with that. I agree with that. And the idea of like the tongue was designed for, but 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 and then was exapted for but 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 is not like that's a it's not a good story like that's it's an involving system of things that created the throat and the larynx and the thing and there was communication needs and breathing needs and all kinds of needs and to say like well you know first it was developed for taste no like i guess you could go back to like cellular evolution or something and make a story over it Anyway, this, there's too much going on to just say, like, it was designed for this and then it accepted to that, I feel. Uh, I, I mean, it's an area where John with like, evolution is always. Yeah, but there is, there is like, the, there is the, the general, like, claim that you make in evolution. Like, when you say something, X is designed for Y, you're saying, like, X appears in many organisms. Mm -hmm. Eyes are designed for photon detection, right? Like the, many organisms yeah. have eyes and they do that very well. You know, mm -hmm. many organisms have tongues and they all, you know, have some things in common and what those tongues can do. Yeah. Right. So if you're saying, what is this recurring motif that happens in many organisms? What's common to it? This, right? And then you see in some organisms, they use that same uh, uh, thing, mm -hmm. like the same trait or, or uh, just physical property that they have that made, and it made them uh, more like, it more, required more less, the, less more mutation. The environment. It required Maybe. less mutation to be used for something else. It didn't require like massive changes to the organism. The thing there was a thing there that was close enough um, to, yeah, to I use think, it. I think there's a lot of times where again we're going to go into physical space, but because it's fine. But you might develop a physical thing, like say thicker skin or something, because maybe the sun is harsh where you're at, and you know the animals that didn't all got wicked sunburned and died. So, but you're the lizards. We're like, nope. We had genetics that made us have thicker skin, so we survived the sun. And then it turns out that your thicker skins also helped you in some other realm, like you could now survive a swim on salt water to get to another island or something. So now your species is all multi-islander. But it was because like your skin evolved because of sun pressure kind of thing. So to to just frame these things like this was for this and then that. It's too simple. Like it's part of a really complicated ongoing process over massive amounts of time. And we want to just say like, it was this for that. And it's a very simple conception. So I guess I don't, I'm not sure at this point why I'm arguing about it in particular, just to say that um, I, I bristle sometimes at the really simplified stories that we use. It's, uh, I want to add on to what Matthew just said, because it's actually a similar point uh, that Gould and, uh, Will want to make in their their spandrels paper about like because basically we're taking like the simplistic nature of like yeah you know just you know take a duck and just look at the tray of the eyes right and just look at or the tray of the web feet just look at the wings right look at the feathers and like you know there's just a simple story like this clearly evolved for this and the reason they, they use the word panglossian paradigm that's a reference to voltaire's uh i think novel candid uh or candide where like there's a guy named Pangloss who's like, yeah, like look, my nose is perfectly, you know, uh, uh, you know, fit for like wearing glasses, and like you know, my, my leg is perf, my legs are perfectly made for trousers, and he just, you know, which are obviously like ludicrous examples, but it's uh, and the point that Gould and uh, Lewontin seem to be wanting to make is that you shouldn't take the any trait in isolation. You should look at the organism as an integrated whole, and it's a complex, you know, set of you know interacting features that like that all matters in the context of that specific organism and like everything that's, that's you know kind of involved in that anyway tag out thank you and that, that is in that context it's just like that's why i also struggle with connecting it to um you know the cognitive and social behavior of, of a single life right like because 
there's a lot of like if we do something for one purpose and then it's used elsewhere like i don't know you can think of social networks right like we have uh we've developed a capacity to make friends and then we can make facebook friends it's like actually facebook was designed to uh you know sit on that factory and like the whole environment and us go through a whole process around that and like again it's just hard to to say that that's acceptation to me that's i was going to address exactly that uh, so as far as i understand john's claims is that uh, um, at some point of time maybe during the paleolithic but maybe later but uh, uh throughout the evolu evolution of culture we came out came out came up with better metaphors and this better metaphors gave us a different way of looking at the world that allowed us to be more adapted to the world that had an adaptive purpose so that is the, the sense in which i understood that that is a, a, a repurposing of everything that i know about ways or a lot of what i know about ways if i think about my life as a journey i can apply all that knowledge that i know about moving through the environment which is very embodied i can use all the the embodied knowledge that i have in that domain in another domain and that gives me a whole set of new different abilities so that that is my understanding at least what do you guys think of that and that becomes really interesting when you think about some not so good metaphors that we came up uh, uh, with recently and we really cling to for example the brain as a computer mm. that's a metaphor that we really like and it is very limited and takes us in a very uh, uh in a lot of wrong directions and it's not very adaptive in some ways yeah matthew is unhappy about it <laughs> oh, is, i agree with your point that the computer is a terrible model i am regularly astounded that people still think that that's a good analogy but you know it's been around for a long time and this this is an example of something where i know the computer side of the story for realsies and so when the analogy is made, I'm like, no. And I only know enough neurobiology to be dangerous. And I can tell, you know, very different animals going on, regardless of what level we're trying to simulate one and the other. But, you know, there's stuff you can pull in the analogy. It's too often that we make an analogy and you're like, this is useful because it's an analogy to help understand it. But then you get caught in the, caught in the analogy and there'll be something that the analogy calls for some relationship between the parts that doesn't work. Like it doesn't map to the thing you were analogizing, but now people will try to infer the thing from the analogy back on to the thing that was trying to be explained. And I think we do that a lot. So tricky. No, for that. one sure. Meals? Ahead. Yeah, so I, I was reading this paper um, by uh, Weilu and colleagues uh, called Harnessing Acceptation and Ecosystem Strategy for Accelerated Innovation, uh, Lessons from the Ventilator Challenge UK. And in it, um, they say that uh, acceptation involves the exploitation of latent functionality, which mm. I think is an interesting contemporary usage of the term and, and maybe gets at, uh, can maybe help clarify some of what we're trying to suss out here. We can also bring the, the symbol and uh, the second clip and use that also to, to inform uh, uh, our discussion. So maybe... Uh, uh, the clip from 35? Yeah. So uh, one, one of, the, one of the, the examples that John talks about is that when trying to figure out justice and trying to figure out how to be just and fair, we have to weigh different uh, uh, and balance things against each other. Um, that would, that context is important for the clip. And then he, um, he talks about how symbols. So we are, he, if I understand it correctly, John is claiming that we are taking everything that we know about balancing things out 
and using that in uh, our understanding of justice. And then having the, the, a scale as a symbol for justice is something that allows us to go back into the state of balancing things out. So our mind is kind of primed to, okay, we are thinking about balancing here. And that helps us focus us trying to understand what justice is about. And that's an example of uh, uh, how a symbol like the scale can help us have a participatory relation to the thing it symbolizes because it puts us in that state of like, yeah, we're talking about balance and balance. Uh, uh. So, and then he's talking about okay. how balance is about the cellar rebellum and the cerebellum is used and it, then we can okay. talk I about it. I will bring up the clip, Valeria. <laughs> uh, so this is episode 35. I added the the clip from the first one uh, and uh, in the episode 35 to the description uh, under this video. So please check it out if you have questions later. And here it is. Suggested to you that instead of just the machinery of projection, which tends to be this one way, that we should think of the participatory relation as reflecting our capacity to play with exaptation. We can we can go sort of both ways with our exaptive machinery. And I try to bring all these ideas together: the notion of participatory notion, uh, uh, knowing, the notion of exaptation, with this idea that. What a, a, a symbol is, it's a, it's a metaphor that allows me to hold something in mind that I normally can't hold in mind. So that I can activate the machinery, the machinery that was at work in acceptation, and I can, in a sense, reverse, go back through it. I can have a symbol of a scale, and I, now I, I, I could just stay there and think that, well, what I can do is I can actually try to participate, right, perspectivally. I can engage with actually balancing. And then what I can do is reverse that process to some degree by which, right, my capacity for balance has been exapted via, right, a, a, some exaptive processing on my cerebellum so that I, I actually use it to find complex contingency relationships between any areas of my brain. So what's been happening, in fact, in neuroscience over the last 10 and 15 years is this revolution of our understanding of the cerebellum. We used to think the cerebellum was primarily about balance, and now we know that the cerebellum has all these terrific uh, cognitive functions because what it does is it basically, here's two areas of the brain that are often correlated together. The cerebellum picks up on trying to improve, smooth out, find the patterns of contingency and dependency between them. And so <coughs> Sorry, I, I was not sure when to stop. Uh, should I go on, Valeria? Like, is it? Okay. I would go on a little bit more, yeah. But okay, okay, I will. So what I can do is I can activate, if you'll allow me this way of talking, my cerebellum and that machinery, is, which is precisely the machinery I need to practice the skill of being more just. I need the ability to coordinate, to find, to sense complex contingencies between multiple variables and make that better. The cerebellum is exactly the machinery I want to, right, I want to activate. I'm using activation sort of as like the reverse of exaptation. I want to activate it because that will actually allow me to participate in the processing that will allow me to cultivate the skills that will make me just, that will then ultimately ground my conception justice okay that would be thank you John. Yeah. yeah okay so if i understood <laughs> it correctly what i understood that he's saying is that justice involve uh, uh involves 
balancing out or figuring out complex uh, uh, contingencies and dependent variables. That's something that mm. we need when we are balancing. We need to balance uh, our muscles, our input visual, our, our, uh, our labyrinth. And that is done by the cerebellum. So the cerebellum knows how to balance things. If I want justice, which is about balancing things, I want to activate the cerebellum. And I activate the cerebellum by giving something, giving it this idea of something that is balanced. And then that uh, allows my mind to be in that state, which is easier for me to focus on the, the justice. That's a little bit what I understood from what he's talking about. Okay. So I just, I, I'm not, I also want to be like, mm -hmm. try to understand what he's saying. Do I become more just by standing on a tight rope on one foot? Because my cerebellum is really activated, right? Like there, there's a, an issue that I'm, I'm trying to say, like how, what does it mean like to activate it and to activate it in that context? And in what way, like, are, are there researches showing that people with, uh, damage to their ability to physically balance also have difficulty to weigh let's say he was talking about i think balancing equations in a different example right to balance equations or uh, or or to um make just like to consider justice in, in that situation Okay, uh, so I uh, like a short pause uh, for yeah. Mills to check out, and then we will continue with the justice and uh, appliance. Or, uh, yeah, Mills. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, I enjoyed this discussion with you guys, and uh, honestly, I learned a lot more about the biological basis of acceptation. And uh, it's really good to be with you, and I'll see y'all later. Thank you, Mills. Okay, Mills. Happy weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, Gilad. Back to your point. Yeah, as I was saying, like if I'm, I'm wondering, like, because John says the cerebellum, and I don't remember that episode enough, and I don't remember if there's a an explanation about any empirical uh, evidence of that. And maybe Kevin, do you know anything about it? Because you tend to be on top of the empirical stuff. I was actually it's funny that you mentioned that. There was a while I didn't look too deep into it, but I remember like being really confused by that claim of like what how do we know? Like exactly your point. It's like, well, how would I know that like are there and I don't know of any at the moment, like, but it's not because I thoroughly like, you know, looked for it, but it's uh but now I have I have a, a useful AI tool I can now use that will like be like, hey, is there any like you know, is there any correlation between like cerebellum and like, you know, people's capacity to solve problems or, you know, balance equations or, you know, try, try to weigh decisions? Like, I could see that being a kind of maybe connection. Um, I'm going to, you know, my, my gut is going to say probably not a lot. Um, but again, it's like, especially when, when John was saying like, oh, so we used to think it was about balance, but like now it's all the cognitive functions. I had a hard time figuring out like what those were and it wasn't clear like what's, like what he's what he's pointing to exactly in the research literature, um, but you know, I'm sure he has a reason, but I just don't know what it is at the moment. So, long-winded way of saying IDK. I found it interesting that instead, uh, I would have imagined that uh, the empirical stuff that I would look for is like when people are making this kind of decisions that would involve justice. Does the cerebellum get activated? That would be the first thing that I would ask. And I don't know the answer. Oh, Matthew, you're mute. I was just going to say, it's, it seems like it's always activated. It'd be difficult. Um, or more activated. I don't than... know. This, this whole space of like, I don't, I'm, I feel like I wouldn't be able to make any claims about justice. Like if that's even just in the equation. Like, well, you know, when you're thinking about justice, this will happen in your brain. I don't even think I believe that. So, like the conception of it will be very simple. At some point, they'll look at it and say, "Oh, yeah, complex." Uh, like having well, more more electrical activity in one lobe of your brain didn't necessarily mean justice, but you know, when we studied it, 
I oh, you can look at you can look at the things right. that are simpler though. Like empirically, you could look at people doing algebra. Okay. Right? Like it's like you could you could try to simplify it if you if you're going like uh, you know the justice isn't a great example, and it might not be. I don't know. Like I don't I mean, know. At least if, in if algebra, trolley problem. Yeah. Hmm? A more well at least in the algebra thing, it would be a more well defined. Thing. Like if you gave somebody an example you can, you can, you can, of just you wanna, of a narrative, and you're like, with which side of this is justice? You can pick a narrative where people would be. I mean, you can put people and, and make them solve trolley problems, right? Like, yeah, five, five people versus, uh, versus one. What if what if one of what them happens, is fast? You know, what very happens, very to, justice what happens to your brain when you're watching a trolley? You're thinking about exactly, it. exactly. Um, Anyway, it's a fuzzy space to make claims, and so, and, and I don't know enough about the neurobiology that John is referring to to, you know, to even really weigh in. But, but I want to, I want to kind of get back to, if, if that's okay, to get back to like examples that where we can talk about exaptation, and there, there are two that come to mind. One that I mentioned before. Uh, which is uh, Zizek and some video uh, was talking about the acceptation of, of a uh, cultural shift. So the sort of socialist, idealist, uh, like French Revolution type of uh, throwing away the past that was like, we know what it was in service of, what the ideology that was behind it, right, was, was, uh, promoting, uh, which is, let's say, in general, uh, you know, freedom, liberty, and uh, uh, something more socialist, like French Revolution style. And then he's cl his claim is that this uh, abandonment of the past actually was exacted into capitalism, right? It was like the, the historical thing is like this allowed capitalism to rise much more uh, fluently or or without without that much resistance than it would in a more traditional environment even though those ideas were not uh embedded in the culture for that purpose you know even for purposes that you can th say is some somewhat ant antithetical to it so let me see if i understood uh, uh culturally people came up with this idea that the past is outdated Something in the like service, that. in the service of the the the, the revolution, yeah. and once we had that capacity to think of the past as outdated, then capitalism could use that capacity of discarding the past in its service, even though the idea of the past as something disposable has uh, come up or been in a, in a completely developed. different and, and antithetical context. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wanted to ask if we can talk about the social exaptation, let's say. Of what? In this case. So, what, what are you, is the question? I'm not sure. Um, uh, let's say, uh, I, I, will, I will change a little bit um, the example. And uh, let's say... Uh, there was a training in NLP, and they said uh, uh, you can use people who are religious, let's say, and uh, and a kind of repurpose their um, kind of basic um, framing of the world for your own um, purposes. Let's say so. Like you can you can repurpose entire societies. Let's say. I I haven't heard about uh, the term um, about uh, about that. Um, so um, social acceptation. I haven't heard about that before. It's just like it came to my mind when I uh, was thinking about. Um, yeah, basically. Yeah. Again, uh, lost at, at formulating, uh, repurposing, uh, repurposing uh, a crowd of people uh, with special programming in their heads, special biases yeah. for uh, 
doing a completely different thing and if it can be called a social adaptation i mean it's manipulation it is a manipulation yes no i mean what makes it exaptation is what i'm trying to to figure out the repurposing part uh, unless i don't understand the exaptation properly it's not adaptive though for the person that it's not making them more fit it's making not them for the crowd fit. yeah you mean for the culture? Yeah. You are making an analogy to what to that what uh, Schlieff was was talking about when an idea is to to what to what Zizek was talking about. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I have, and forgive me because I'm going to go back to the biology space for a little bit. But I think I have like an idea of what maybe Kara is talking about. Um, so there's like this. It was a video by Matt Williams I was looking at for like preferences, which are also called prejudices, prejudices in biology, but like they don't mean that in a the way we normally use prejudice. But basically, you know, you have this, what he, what he was describing like the difference between like a, a so like think about like Arctic wolves, right? So like Arctic wolves, you know, are going to have a prejudice uh, for really white coats because that's really helpful for hunting. And if there's like, you know, someone with a dark coat, they're usually outcast from the group, right? Which is not actually, you know, it isn't, I'm gonna be careful my words here because I want to, don't want to say adaptive, but like it's not it doesn't help the fitness of that individual wolf, right, to be thrown out of the group because he's screwed. Um, but it does increase the overall species fitness, right, because they're selecting out that kind of darker uh, coat. And if they do exist, they usually have a lower ranking in their kind of social hierarchy. Um, but then he uses this example to talk about phobias, and it's like, okay, so why do some people have phobias of things they've never seen, right? And so he goes into this, you know, kind of you know, think about some examples of like, or you know, kind of constructing like, okay. Maybe you have a subset of humans, right, who lived in an area where, like, they didn't really have that many, like, venomous spiders that were a threat. And so like, they were either benign, like, really not that prevalent. But then they moved to an area where there's, like, a bunch of black widows and brown lacrosses, right? And so a few people get bit. And, uh, and you know, and just for the sake of this, the story, it's, like, these spiders have also not been around, you know, humans or primates of this kind of type. So they don't have a reason to want to go away from them. So, you know, people die very quickly and it becomes, like, very salient, right, in their kind of awareness. So they, they they have a cultural prejudice now where they, they teach their children, hey, stay away from spiders. Spiders are just bad, bad news. And eventually, you know, what what Williams is going to argue is that this can select for people just to have just, you know, uh, genetically, because like there's a cultural pressure on it to select for like a disposition to have a phobia for spiders, even though no one's taught them. Like they've, you know, they're born, they're raised maybe in a different culture where that wasn't actually taught to them. But they still have that impulse of like, whoa, no spiders, no way, right? Same thing for heights. Um, you, know, you can imagine people who didn't live in places with like a lot of high, you know, steep slopes you can fall off of. But then they moved to a place where that happened, and then people kept dying very easily when they fell off a high place. Um, and they would teach each other, hey, don't don't go near high places. But then, given enough iterations of a uh, of natural and sexual selection, then you get, you know, for some people, a phobia of heights or spiders. Um, so anyway, I want to that in there because I think that's maybe what Carr was talking about, where it's like maybe I can have. Um, no. It is. It's it's a sort of uh, sort of like society. For example, with the heights and the place with a lot of spiders, right? Uh, you can um, use um, teachers who are supposed to teach children, let's say, about how to read. But you can also use teachers about the spiders and about the heights, and so you can shape the society differently. Uh, not to live in the heights or not to live in the places with a lot of spiders. Or you can even place your, uh, use teachers to program the children and the future generations to kill all the spiders. That's what I'm talking about. That that type of uh, exaptation. I don't know if it's exaptation. It's 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 a social. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I might be trying to. Uh, pull uh, the term of exaptation into um, into a political thing. So I would like to ask for forgiveness for that. I think you are thinking one level higher than uh, uh, the one, mm -hmm. and maybe G Jack is thinking one level higher than the one that John is talking about. So you have like oh, yeah, that's biological, sure. <laughs> biological evolution, and then you have cognitive uh, uh, evolution, and then you are talking about mm -hmm. cultural evolution. Which Cultural, one, one yeah, step that's out, what yeah. I'm talking about. So you have the, the, the biological uh, fitness, 
you have the cognitive fitness, how, how fit I am in my environment, in my culture, and I think, and then how fit the culture is as a whole. So I think it, uh, it might be a different <laughs> upcycle uh, agrees with us. Uh, I would like to bring back to the lower level, though. Uh, I am sorry, like I wanted to one up uh, Zizek point a little bit that Gilad brought in. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's like mm, I do lack the verbal uh, capabilities to express my thoughts clearly. I have it in the in the head, but uh, each time I speak, it doesn't come out the way I, it sounds in my brain. So excuse me. Uh, okay, so upside, like, uh, uh, re returning us back to the point of justice, and um, I guess cerebellum as well. The concept of uh, restorative ju justice with focuses on uh, repairing harm and reconciling relationships can be viewed as an adaptation of traditional punitive justice systems. Can, can we? Uh, mm -hmm. I think about that in the sense that, like, maybe the missing link in all of those levels is, let's say, technological adaptation. It's also an example that was used is like, there the Gutenberg press, like the, the uh, I saw this example that uh, I think it was all on Kara server, right? Um, that like there was all the components, but they didn't have like the machinery to actually press the letters into the page. And then Gutenberg visited some winery, and he saw this um, cork press there, and it was like existing technology for hundreds of years. And he used that te that technology to to do something completely different with it. Um, I've got one. And, Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Go I'm just finish. I'm just asking, like, is in that sense, yeah. like he he called it an adaptation, and I'm trying to think whether it's uh, or he. he made an analogy that's like exaptation i'm trying to think whether that's uh a good point to sort of maybe ground it like because I, I think it has to be something if i'll finish the point um no uh i think it does have to be something like that it already exists it was developed for a different purpose right and then the um uh, evolutionary step of an organism or of a culture or, or of a civilization to uh, to move to a, a, a better uh, state, more productivity, in, if it's technological, let's say, uh, is made much easier than it would have been otherwise. The, the other example along those lines for the technology acceptation that I know from my own studies is uh, punch cards. So computer punch cards. IBM era, they're like little columns and punch out holes and the machine can read where the holes are electronically and now you store information on the card. Ooh, that was already being done in loom spaces. So people who were running looms and they had a pattern that they wanted to put onto a piece of cloth that they were making, they would have cards that had holes in them and then that the holes were used to control the machinery that was used to, you know, I don't remember the name of the parts, but to change the way the sliders worked so that you'd end up with a certain pattern. And so that, like the Jacquard's loom, maybe? Uh, but that loom process of using cards to store the information of the pattern for the loom was exacted very directly into the space of we need to store data on a card, like in a physical form. Like we want the data pattern of it needs to be stored. We've got these cards that are being used in looms, and we can use the same thing, only read it much faster. So, like that strikes me as a really nice example of a technological acceptation where, you know, the the ability to store the pattern was exempted from one medium into another. Like the same mechanism, how you can like encoding something in the physical pattern of something else and extracting it as information on the other side. That skill was brought from one technology into another. So I guess, like, I have a question about the, uh, maybe the whole sense of Reiki's use of the whole exacted cognitive exaltation, because this is kind of going back to the point I made earlier about the Arctic wolves, where it's like, it does not help that one wolf who has a darker coat, like, you know, their fitness is kind of fucked, right? Just, you know, to put it bluntly, but, you know, 
so I'm, I'm curious like is Verveke talking about it at the like organism level or at the species level like what is he you know and i think organism level uh when when he talks about at least uh psychotechnologies right i think he's talking about individuals being able to be more adaptive individually because at least like in the, in the clips i've heard him right he might, he might talk about the other things but generally like it, i can be uh better by exacting um exacting machinery that that's already embedded in it and the culture gives you psychotechnologies that allows you to do that the culture for example will give you rituals that will help you access things that or give you metaphors that will help you access things that you would not come up by with yourself That is at least my understanding of it. Does anyone else have a different take or are you all kind of all on the same page? It's like probably at the, the organism level, not the species or like collective level. I think it's the organism level. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm, ju I'm not like, I'm not saying that that's the term. I'm just saying like specifically the thing that John talked about in the specific list I watched. Like probably if you ask him, he might have like a more complex example of where it's organism level and where it's uh, society level. But just, I guess is that's like what he, he would answer. But um, like specifically when, when he was saying about justice, he was talking about a cerebellum, right? Like the, like that's, that's the, we don't have a shared cerebellum. <laughs> Every, everybody... Yeah. He's talking about a cerebellum. But he is also talking about the symbol of using a scale to undo. It's like we are using the cerebellum that is made for balance to think about justice. Now let's go back through the symbol and uh, uh, and activate the cerebellum when we're thinking about justice. Let's let's go back to where we were to make to make the thinking about justice not really thinking, but embodying it, to participate in it. So maybe that kind of brings us back to, to the point before about like, what is the claim? Like whether, whether I'm better at balancing equations when I'm, uh, you know, standing on one foot. Um, the... I don't think that you if I understood the claim correctly, you might even be worse. Because mm -hmm. what, my cerebellum is preoccupied? Yeah. Um, it works both ways. However it comes out. It I don't know. Support, I don't know. support your bias. Like, there's... There's an element that says, like, you should... When, like, you should be embodying it. You should, like, what he says... Like, where in this clip, which I, I forgot about, that he's using the word activation as sort of the opposite way of exaptation. So the opposite way is, is instead of um, from the physical balancing that made us be able to balance uh, complex situations and equations, he's saying like, you want to balance a complex situation or equation, try to physically balance or to, to to no. uh, use the same sort of uh, notions of physically balancing stuff. Use the same brain area, because brain that area. brain area is good for it. Yeah, yeah. So he's not even claiming that you should, that he's claiming that you do. And I don't know where he got that claim from. That would have to see if there are, yeah. I mean... Yeah. It's no, probably it, based on uh, uh, studies. I would assume that it's based on studies of people balancing things and activating the cerebellum. Isn't I he don't saying know. that you should? Isn't, isn't that like that clip saying something like um, you should? At least that's how I, I understand so. it. Okay. I don't think so. I'm, I, what I understood is that when you are considering justice or when you are trying to, to act justly, you will use the cerebellum because it's good for it. It's good at figuring out complex contingencies. So that's what you naturally will use. 
And uh, uh, if you want to think about uh, justice and concentrate on it and, and think about it in a participatory way, you, uh, instead of thinking just propositionally, instead of thinking just sentences and words and concepts about justice, if you want to think about it in a way that goes deeper, you can use this symbol that will put you in the same place that you are when you are doing justice and that will help you out. So, so let's, let's, I think related to something else that John says, like about um, developing the skills, he talks about like when he went to this return to the source thing with uh, tracking, things like that. If I have a daily practice in which I activate my cerebellum, like balancing, like should that, open my mind up to being more proficient, more adaptive. Like there, because there has to be a thing, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. if, if that's the area that works, then working it out should help me. Right? He does say, he does say that when he started with the martial arts thing, the way he ar his argumentation skills changed to embody some of the qualities that he got with his martial arts training. So I don't know about the balancing, but uh, uh, whatever he was doing in his martial, martial arts and his Tai Chi practice did uh, um, show up in the way he thought about things and the mm -hmm. way he made arguments, or he does make that claim. You can make a yeah. direct argument that the Tai Chi practices makes mm -hmm. one very aware of balance. There are any number of extra balance and flow. Yeah. Connectivity and how things, you know, how your whole body is operating individually. Your arm is moving here and there, but you have a center of balance. And you have a stance and you can begin to feel it. And you can begin to understand all the stuff. And you're like, it was all going on before, but, you know, in doing the practice of Tai Chi, you're constantly butting up against all the balance points. And you're like, oh, I'm off balance. Like you, somebody could ask you after you've been practicing it for when are you in balance or off balance? And they would be able to tell you just from having practiced it. So now, is that where you can accept that exactly? I don't know. I need to get into the space of claims, but it does feel like uh, that can start to go into other areas of your life. Hmm. Just your awareness of body balancing. Maybe it keeps you more present. So I think I'm still kind of lost on this, like the inverse, or the, I guess I won't say the inverse, but the reverse of like the acceptation so that's i think somewhat clear to me right it's like it had original function and now we're going to use it for something else that's you know helps with the cognitive fitness whatever that means um but what is what is this activation thing like so do you maybe use it to tai chi example so is it like doing tai chi right i get the center balance and then like maybe i get in a heated argument with someone i realize oh i'm off balance and I kind of use that to like like but you know it's not clear to me there's a direction there like i don't know like how to make sense of that? Someone can speak to that. Maybe that will help. So, like, if if we go to the biological example, the most kind of silly way to say it is if the tongue was developed for moving food around in your mouth and detecting poison, but it was exempted for speech. Then somehow. If I eat, like I, I just chew gum all day, right? I use my tongue a lot, then I should be much better at speaking, right? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure, like, but that seems like the what activation should be, like you're using the original thing and then... That's, that's very good. Imagine somebody who uh, could not digest and has been fed intravenously a... Uh, uh, all his life and never use the tongue to 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 move food around in their mouth. Would that affect their uh, uh, ability to speak? I guess it probably would. They probably were speaking. It's gonna be a difficult experiment. See, I was wondering based on like what <laughs> Cloud was both saying. Mute oh, and yeah. have digestive issues. Well, so I want to modify what Cloud was saying a little bit because there's like. Because whenever you said like the you know the like the tongue for like you know whatever poison stuff, so is is active you know is so tongues for let's just say for the sake of argument it's it's for poison detection, 
or whatever, moving food around and stuff. And then we learn how to use it to speak. We zapped it into speech. But then I use speech to tell people, don't eat that shit. It's poisonous. Is that me doing activation when I start speaking to someone to like mm -hmm. get them to not do the thing? No? And why not? Yeah. Sorry to cut this in the middle, but I do have to go. Oh, oh. Uh, no, we're losing another one. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's like hold life. on, hold on, Gilad, Gilad, check out, check out properly, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it was it was really interesting. I was glad I found some time to um, participate. Uh, and thanks everyone for all of the insight you provided. Send you, man. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the energy into the room. <laughs> I appreciate it. Sure. All right. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Uh, so uh, the different uh, types we consider exaptation. Uh, and um, I have like several questions from the audience. And uh, one of oh. them uh, would be about uh, use of animals yeah to to kind of extend our uh, capabilities i actually considered it as um, um a, a kind of shared cognition element when we use dogs and uh, pigs to sniff out uh, whatever dogs can sniff out the prey Truffle. pigs, pigs can sniff out the truffles here is the comment and uh, can we talk about this function as a form of exaptation, as a type of exaptation or not? What do you guys think? Are we do in restorative I, I don't justice know. or the thing you said? I think you put the wrong comment on because you're talking mm -hmm. about triple Oh, thing, sorry, right? sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. It's Those even two higher. things seem different. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that, that one. <laughs> um it's a repurposing yeah it's a repurposing i don't i don't know this this acceptation i guess in a way it's a little fuzzier because everything is multi-purpose like why do you have a dog you, know, you have a dog for a lot of reasons because it hears things and it sets off alarms and it eats your scraps and it helps guard and it helps for hunting and and now it can find truffles so you like all right <laughs> which of those came first and what was exapted from what but you know the the dog had the skill of super sensitive sensitive sniffer and humans were like hmm how can we exapt that skill to our benefit that's like a you know a reapplication of the dog's ability like we are using the dog for sure hopefully in a nice way it's definitely not more is it more adaptive to the dog does it make the dog more fit i mean if the environment we're providing a lot of that environment right if he's used yeah. to, to fit human? To spending time in human spaces and you're like well we've got some standards so it's got to fit to that <laughs> i mean i guess it would you know it's funny because i guess the it would increase fitness of the species of dogs who could do that well because it increase her capacity to survive because we'd keep them alive, mm -hmm. we'd protect them, and it also increase the capacity for uh, reproduction because we, we'd probably breed them actually, right? To select for that, mm -hmm. um, which is actually I think, called artificial uh, selection, or like human, basic human intervention when we do stuff like that. But anyway, like, yeah, it's interesting to think about. Like, I don't know, like, in terms of our cognitive, you know, fitness, say, it's interesting to think, like, well, is that like, you know, because I guess. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to disentangle like what would what is it that's being improved and like and like what cognitive process is being improved when I'm like selecting dogs for, for being this. It's like it I guess there's a lot of them. This is the thing that I get, you know, kind of annoyed with for Vicky about. It's like whenever it's just cognition, that is not like one thing. That is there's a bunch of different processes that like intermingle and overlap and sometimes are, you know, can be disambiguated, but as like, you know, kind of independent things happening. In the nervous system but the uh 
but whatever, right? Like, you know, there's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine like, what's the thing in our cognition, whether it's like vision, is it like hearing, is it olfactory senses? Is it like my capacity to taste? Is it like, I don't know, like what is it that's being improved on our side of things? Um, even at the organism, organism level, it's like, it's not clear to me what that would look like. Like what's, like I can see the dog thing that's, you know, there's a kind of acceptation there and like, it's improving their fitness in a way where we protect them, right? And they reproduce and, but I don't know how that like would reflect back onto us. Maybe someone else can speak to that, but I don't know. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the point, the obvious point is that we get truffles. <laughs> no, yeah. But I, I don't know that. if that would be enough. Oh yeah, it's, like maybe, okay. So if the truffles were like, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say it's increased fittedness to our need of truffles. Yeah, like, <laughs> well, it would be, it would be like increasing our capacity to survive if truffles were like the main source of our diet, right? I guess. Yeah, if there's big if yeah. on that one there. Yeah, we'll but be yeah, without the truffles, yeah. but you know, the, apparently they're neat. I huh. wasn't impressed. But maybe I got bad truffles. Or like dogs, like honey heard... dogs, right? Yeah. No, I heard somewhere uh, that um, cats evolved to be as cute as possible. <laughs> <laughs> So that they can uh, have a human, um, let's say, um, care of them. Yeah, yeah caretaker. Just, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever looked at the English language? Have you ever, well, you may not know these expressions, but um, <laughs> we have a whole variety of expressions that imply that people used to be very mean to cats. You can hardly oh. move in here without swinging a cat. And uh, there's a whole mess of them. The swinging a cat. What is that? So swinging the cat would be like, take the cat and like, shoo. Yeah. Like, uh, like whatever David they were, did uh, to defeat they were the Goliath. Of, well, I don't know if like, he used the cat as a slingshot. Say? Exactly. But okay. I'm just saying there are expressions that imply that we used to have an awful lot of cats, primarily vermin control. They'd eat the mice, and we had like feed and stuff that we were trying oh, to the keep. Cat eating the the mice, that's like... Yeah, that's like that was the primary use of cats. You're like, they eat the mice. The cats are like, these are delicious, and we're like, good, eat everyone you can find, but <laughs> keep it going. And then you know the cats would breed, and you'd have a lot of cats. And apparently that could be a problem anyway. And then we would treat them badly. So this whole idea of like cats evolved because they're cute. Like maybe once we got to cat breeding, we're like, I want to make a teacup whatever and i want to maximize fluffiness and you know and then we did and we ended up with all these different breeds so that part of the evolution so we of cats evolved may be cats cuteness. we said we want cuteness and we were like these will sell we good. did that yeah i think the cat was just like optimized for i don't know can catch mice can breed way along those lines those were probably most of the cats that were around tom cats probably did pretty well during that phase less well now because they don't make good house cats. Big orange tomcats, not so, the one you want to pick. Okay, M Matthew, like, uh, and like to the room as well in general, the question is, so we evolved somebody to be cute. Uh, also, how mm -hmm. about uh, Neuralink, uh, all the external exoskeletons that people build? And Mills specifically asked about cycling. What is cycling? You mean bicycling? Bicycling, yes. So uh, going on a bicycle and uh, like uh, technology in general, like right? Yeah, that's like technology. yeah, like an extended form of uh, is functioning. that an acceptation? Yeah, is that acceptation? That's the question. Can we see that acceptation? Maybe I want to go back and and uh, uh, point and see it and point that out, point something else. So. I think the key point why we are talking about acceptation is like evolution and uh, being more fit to the environment does not necessarily need to come from scratch. It can use things that are already there that were used for something else, but then you kind of, uh, uh, you don't need to create something new all the time. So if that, how that relates to technology in general is technology acceptation or because bike is a form of technology right so mill set up cycling and I, I looked up i just looked up like because i think i know or at least i had an idea what that is apparently it's the creative reuse 
uh, of like waste materials. It's like byproducts waste. So it'd be like, you know, the people who like make art out of like, you know, plastic bottles, something like that. You know, it's an example of uh, that's of cycling. Cycling. That's uh, cycling. Upcycling. C Y C L A. So what are we talking about? Like, is it because his question was cycling? No, it wasn't. It, it was upcycling. I read it. Vague. He said upcycling. No, there's said, both. There's cycling yeah. and upcycling. Oh no, it's upcycling. Yeah, yeah he said upcycling. upcycling. Yeah. yeah. We should put the quote up, Ken. Let's okay, I'm Let's sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, of course. He said. Uh, he said uh, use is upcycling. Yes. Is up space cycling. Yeah. Oh. So upcycling is the reusing reusing of stuff that was already in the recycling. Repurposing, yeah, yeah, that's the word. That's the word that actually kind mm -hmm. of uh, keeps being uh, used in that context. I think there's probably some. I mean, a lot of business actually goes along those lines. So just, I mean, to take out the word upcycling, or just you'd have a process and it would produce some waste product. And you get a lot of that. Waste. Suppose you're very successful in your processing these things. You get all this waste product. And you're like, you know what? We're going to make belts. We're going to sell leather because we have a lot of this stuff. And eventually putting that entire waste stream. Man, I hate to put cows in that term there. But uh, any kind of a thing that you're manufacturing, if you've got a leftover be it beer yeast at the bottom of the thing and you try to sell it to Australians and tell them it's Marmite, it's delicious, and they believe it. So it's upcycling of the yeast that was at the bottom of the barrel, and now it's a product. So you know, win <laughs> for everybody. Well, and so one thing that's it's maybe useful to describe like the downcycling is like the opposite of this. And so they're both kind; they're both part of the recycling process. So like, and the, so just real quick, downcycling is like it basically like we're converting materials into uh, new materials, sometimes of lesser quality. But upcycling is like we're converting materials to something of higher quality. It's like now has artistic value or it has like, you know, some type of, you know, whatever. Um, so is like Marmite up or down cycling? What was that? Is Marmite, Marmite. up or down cycling? So describe Mar Marmite again because I think I was distracted by reading stuff. Oh, I think you need experience it yourself or Vegemite. Either one of those would do. Next time you're at your grocery store, look them up okay. and try some. Oh. And then you'll be able to explore the space <laughs> and they experiential participatory manner i think would be important it's one oh, of those love it or hated things yeah. some it's people nasty. love it and some people hate try it. it it's one of the things where people will try it around the table and say this is terrible here try some it's, <laughs> it's not gonna kill you oh it's yeah good. it's like a shared experience uh taking yeah. something terrible and share it around uh, it's like bonding through pain that That's why people like Vegemite. <laughs> okay, a, a good uh, final point. Uh, guys, we are like about to finish up here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So, uh, Upcycle, Upcycle Club. Okay. Uh, an example of downcycling is when you get an old airplane and transform it into a Playground, for example. Or Why is it down? Because it doesn't fly anymore? Yes. It, it's it like it's not used for its, its intended use, purpose. For its first purpose. Something. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're getting it into the space of weighing, you know, what is mm -hmm. its better thing. Yeah. Like once the plane is already like it crashed or enough damage is done, you're just like, now it's not really a plane. Now it's like a crash plane. So I either have a thing that's going to sit in a junkyard rotting or... I can do something else with it. You could sink it in a shallow ocean and suddenly the reef is alive. And you're like, oh, didn't but know we could use planes for that, but we can. Well, I think we what do. Harris was saying, though, or Upcycle Club, I guess, was saying is that, like, mm -hmm. assuming the airplane still works and it's functional, like, I think he, that's what he was getting at. Yeah, but oh, you wouldn't okay. use that for a playground, so that's a bad example. Well, but that's, what, that's why it would be downcycling. Is you're reducing the value by converting it to other materials. I guess I'm saying we would never do that, at least yeah, not with an airplane. But, oh. So it's a weird example. No, but it's a good point. point. Isn't that a good? You can take your Learjet jet and downcycle it. If it no, works, uh, so down like upcycle when you take something that has no value and do, uh, upgrade it. Let's say and downcycle uh, when you take something that has value and downgrade it. Yeah, am I correct? I guess, you could turn your Tesla into a planter if you want. But I, would, I think this <laughs> oh, is a weird God. example. Like a, a massive. I'm talking about it. <laughs> With the 
down cycle the conversation. Yes. <laughs> oh my god, we down cycle the conversation. <laughs> but just repurposing stuff, especially if it's stuff that you for whatever reason you have a lot of send the life cycle of a product in a creative way that reached its end. Oh there you go. So it's already like not it really an airplane. Yeah. Okay. But you're like, now what do we do with it? And you're like, well, we could toss it. We could, blah, blah, blah. let's, especially since you have a whole like field of them, you try to think of some other stuff you could do. We're going to figure out that windmill blades problem. Apparently I want to, a lot of windmill blades. Oh, yeah. Like, with, so I want to address Mill's actual question of like, is upcycling example exaptation? I don't think it is because like, because that has to do with an organism or a cognitive process, right? Or at least you want to go to the cultural level, right? Maybe there's maybe there's something there to say, but like, I don't know how that would somehow improve the cognition or cognitive fitness, right? Uh, or the biological fitness of an organism. Um, so, I mean, maybe y'all can make a counter argument. I'm, I'm curious if y'all have one. I'm going to try to do the counter. I'm going to try to say it's at a societal level, we're creating things that could be recycled. And we're trying to look for ways to be more efficient. And so we're, you know, because we're trying to be in balance with the environment in which we live. And so if we have a bunch of leftover stuff and then we have creative endeavors and things, we're like, well, you know, instead of like buying all new craft mm -hmm. stuff, I'm going to go to this store and somebody set up a, a restore, we have a number of these things locally, uh, where it's just like old construction materials or, you know, it's not usually first quality stuff. And you often can't find exactly what you thought you were looking for, but you'll find something. And um, like those kinds of spaces where you can repurpose stuff as opposed to just putting it in a landfill strikes me as like the culture is saying, you know, recycling is good, but we're going to accept that thing into also expanding creativity and trying to engender the idea of you know, using all of the resources that we put into this thing. And so you really can't get any more from it. So like really trying to extend the use of things into other spaces. We're exacting that intention maybe. Well, and you just, you, you convinced me that it is accept acceptation because it would increase our fittedness by us not messing up the environment as much, right? If yeah. we have a cycle, right? It's like kind of reuse materials in a way that improves the quality and in turn makes us use less materials right extracting from you know let's say rare yeah. metals or something like that doing stuff you know with what we already have you know to entertain ourselves with whatever purpose uh reduces our footprint so yeah I I think I of something of and we were we mentioned this before like there's all these different levels of that acceptation and that strikes me as maybe something that's cultural or civilizational Mm -hmm. I think it's also biological, right? Because if it helps our survival by not depleting the environment, then like that would be a biological expectation of us, like you know, we're increase our fitness by repurposing this thing for another thing that increase our chances for survival, which is like you know, be thrifty. Yeah. yeah. No, I I am like before we closing, I actually have on the surface a question: Can the individual biological acceptation uh, go against uh, the societal? Um, Mm. like uh, cultural acceptation in general. I think one of the things that John is pointing mm -hmm. out is that our mind is doing that all the time. It's using uh, uh, things that we know about a certain domain and transplanting that to another domain. That's how the brain operates. It's like you are not doing things from scratch you are you reusing things all the time. And that's why we think about minds uh, like computers, because we already know that computers store information and manipulate information and output information. And then we think, oh, minds do the same things. Let me get all this knowledge from one domain and transfer it to the other. So I can imagine the question is, if you go against are you being more adaptive? Maybe the, the thing that is in your environment is not very adaptive for you, and then you get out this, this new thing that clicks all the light bulbs, and it's like, oh, everybody around me sees things in that way, but I have this better way of seeing it. The question is, where did you get that from? Mm. This makes that doesn't make sense. 
that idea that yes. like you're oh, you're always running an acceptation search you're like wait what can i accept this into or like you're just doing it without even meaning to do it um the example that came to mind for me of that is i was whitewater kayaking and doing that all day and you read the river and you have to you know determine where to eddy out and you're watching currents and blah 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 and then on the way home very tired it's a long day um i find myself doing that like eddying out behind cars on a highway on the um, mm. interstates obviously it's not the same situation like it's flow of traffic but not you know there's no water pushback etc but anyway my brain is just thinking in terms of like oh, i gotta eddy out behind this truck up here um and so that makes me wonder if those kind of processes of, you know, here's this thing that my mind has shaped itself to doing all day. Now I'm going to apply it to the next thing. And if sometimes that happens, we're like, oh, that's useful. And then, you know, that then leads us to apply that skill in some new, do in some new domain. Like that we might actually be sort of exploring the space of how can they use these other tools in ways that we don't even, you know, recognize that we're doing. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I would like to close the session today. Uh, and uh, for that, I will invite my participants to check out, as always. So, Kevin, uh, what are you taking with you today? Also, open um, questions. Yeah. What am I taking with me today? Um, that's a funny way to frame it. Uh, well, I don't know. It takes not the right word, but uh, I guess I experiencing gratitude because it's like a fun place right to kind of hash out these ideas and uh yeah maybe the thing that comes to mind again like my working memory isn't the best so like there's probably other things i'm gonna take away later at once i reflect on the conversation but like top of mind is like this kind of level level thing like the biological acceptation the cognitive acceptation and maybe the cultural acceptation that one's like kind of still iffy for me like is that is that like coherent because like what what is being fit like the kind of culture the kind of values like that's still kind of not you know, but, but that whole idea of like the kind of sectoring off different layers and levels and like whether or not they, they compete or are in alignment is, I think, an interesting notion that I'm going to think more about. Um, and open questions, I guess, I kind of just mentioned one, right, is like, I don't know that that let's call it the top level of like cultural, you know, acceptation. What what is the organism that's, that's you know, like the metaphor, like what's the metaphor for the organism there and the species there, like at that layer is not quite clear to me. Um, so yeah, I'll probably think more about it. Um, and thank you, uh, as always, for hosting this. And uh, I will pass the torch to, do I pick or do you want to pick? Uh, I pick, Matthew. Power of the Kara. Um, I guess I'm going to echo the fact that I, some, this didn't come up too much, that I see this as um, being related a lot to the ecology of practices where you attempt a whole number of things that you just are not necessarily super related or don't seem related. Like you might be creating some stuff or doing some art or doing some Tai Chi balancing or doing mindfulness exercises or interacting with other people in a certain uh, dialogous manner. There's all sorts of different aspects in there that the skills that come from trying to do those things in the ecology of practice, uh, you see them sh showing up in other ecologies of practice. You find, oh yeah, like this, I can see myself doing that. I think I have a tendency to do that now a little bit because I was doing it in this other thing. And that kind of exaptation uh, of meant in the cognitive space strikes me as like an interesting thing to be aware of uh, that we have those kind of capabilities. So I'm going to keep looking for them and noticing when I'm exempting something because maybe it'll help me see more places where I can exempt more skills. I have a best of Valeria. Yeah, so the thing that I'm thinking about right now is that uh, if the process through which we learn and our cognition evolves is always building on what is already there, People that have evolved in great different, uh, in very different cultural environments, they might be talking about the same thing, but the base metaphors and the base uh, uh, 
embodied things that they are using might differ. So they might use different ways to think about that. For example, uh, I was raised believing in uh, karma and rebirth, even though my family is Christian, that that was the kind of Christianity that we had in Brazil. Uh, so for me, this idea of life as a constant evolution of morality and, uh, uh, I don't know, spiritual development is a natural thing that it's present in my native religion. And that uh, I have been noticing that when I am talking about wisdom, that shapes a lot of the way that I think things when you go deep, that is different than somebody who was raised, for example, in a pro Protestant religion that uh, uh, have a completely different way of how to engage with spirituality. And so the thing that I'm thinking about right now is that uh, uh, how does the basis of what we have learned, our natural environment when we were very little, shape what we ground our, uh, our learnings after that and how it might be different from person to person. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm, as having an open question for myself right now. Karen. So for me, uh, the idea of um, participatory knowing, participating in the world, and uh, let's say, accepting the things that we have already at hand, for a different purpose and then the difference between acceptation and adaptation that we talked about today a lot um, that was very very illuminating uh, I, I am aware of the um, of the fact that uh, social acceptation does not exist at the moment and I brought it up because I just thought it would be funny in a way, as a mind exercise. Um, it brought me a lot of joy, in a way, as well, uh, to practice that, uh, I don't know, very random idea. Um, it, was, it was really, really pleasurable. And uh, before I close today, I would like to make a small announcement. So on the Awakening from the Minion Crisis Discord server, on the 5th of December at uh, 10.30 EST, so Eastern uh, Pacific time. Is it? No. Yeah, whatever. It's like uh, 10.30 EST. Um, there will be um, a lecture introduction into Feldenkrais method but by Seth Dillinger. Uh, who like a couple times appeared on uh, John Ferwaki podcast, uh, Voices with Ferwaki. Um, yeah, I, I just want to announce uh, if you guys haven't yet joined the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord server, please join now and uh, also, yeah, come and uh, see how it um, self presentation uh, participate tomorrow. Oh, no, tomorrow on Monday, there will be dialogues run by Valeria. Uh, as well at the same time, 10.30 EST. Um, yeah. No need to apply for it. No need to register. Just show up. That's it. That's as much as it takes. Show up. It's voluntary. Uh, it's your work. Uh, big, big gratitude to the panel today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Also, to people who left, uh, Mills and Gilad, thank you guys as well, if you catch up the replay. Uh, big gratitude to the people who caught it live in the studio, in the audience as well. Upcycle Club, Mills, uh, and the people, sorry, I didn't name you by name. And... Can, can yeah. I say one more thing? Yeah. If, uh, if people who are watching this later, um, the, re uh, what, the recorded version, have ideas of things for us to talk about or questions or, or uh, uh, yeah, just ideas of subjects for, for the next stream. Just put it on the comment and then we can uh, uh, 
yeah, then we have idea for the next ones. Thank you. That's an excellent, that's an excellent suggestion, Valeria. Thank you so much. Also, buy me a cup of coffee if you would like to. Uh, sure. Yep. Uh, all the all the money from donations and uh, coffee and Patreon uh, will go to just paying rent for my mom and grandma. That's it. Yeah. And on that note, bye. They're in Ukraine, by the way. Just 